Is the Antichrist a person? How has the spirit of Antichrist been at work? Have you ever yielded to the spirit of Antichrist? Can we discern and overcome the spirit of Antichrist? 1 John chapter 4 verse 3 to 4 But every spirit who does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. You have heard that he is coming. And now he is already in the world. Little children, you belong to God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. 2 John chapter 1 verse 7 to 8. Reject false teachers. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. They refuse to acknowledge Jesus the Messiah as having become human. Any such person is a deceiver and an antichrist. See to it that you don't destroy what we have worked for, but that you receive your full reward. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm bringing you a very important uh, teaching today. Um, I understand that, um, you know, some churches, they operate by Bible college. But uh, here, I'm sharing with you uh, what a Bible college would teach. Um, this is a very, very important lesson because if you don't understand this, you won't be able to release God's blessings in your life. If you don't understand this, you will be stuck and uh, you will just be religious and uh, you don't understand it and you try to look around for the Antichrist and you try to see who is the Antichrist. Maybe is, uh, I mean, in the past they said that it was Henry Kissinger and sometimes they said that it's... Uh, Steve Job, and sometimes they said that is uh, Elon Musk. So we need to understand um, this lesson. Amen. It's very, very important in this teaching. So understand the spirit of Antichrist and receive true freedom in Christ. When you understand the spirit of Antichrist and how it operates, it will stop you from walking in deception and also it will release God's blessings in your life because with understanding and revelation, God is able to release his plan and his blessings for you. All right, so go, going into the lesson, the word antichrist appear only four times in the Bible, only four times. I understand that a lot of people talk about the antichrist almost every day, teachings on the Antichrist every day, but actually the word only appears four times in the Bible, and they are all in the Epistle John. They're all in the Epistle John, the apostle who wrote the book of Revelations. And let's look at those four important scriptures. Go with me to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Now, I have prepared for you today a summary of church history that is to do with this teaching. All right, so please avail yourself to the study notes uh, on the welcoming table. And also, I've done a comparison between the spirit of Christ and the spirit of Antichrist. So you can actually compare the two. And of course, today's sermon is also printed. And uh, please avail yourself to it on the welcoming table. So if you look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18... Let's read this together. One, two, three. Little children, it is that last time, as you have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So when we talk about the end times, we're not just talking about this generation. We're not just talking about this century. When we talk about the end times, it has started with the book of Acts. Okay, so please understand that it's been for a while. And I want you to notice the sentence that come in line four or line three. There are many antichrists. So that means the antichrist is not just one person and is not just one political system. There are many antichrists. That means whoever yields to the spirit of Antichrist. 
whoever yields to the spirit of Antichrist. Okay, so we're going we're to understand more what it means by that. So we need to understand that this scripture is referring to a lying spirit that seeks to influence people. A lying spirit that seeks to influence people. And that's why the Bible says we need to pray for kings. We need to pray for those who are in authority. Why? Because they can influence a lot of people. Because sometimes they even control a community or control a nation or control an ethnic group. So to be in, leader, in a leadership position, you are in a very responsible position position. And it's important that you have people praying for you, and it's important that you pray for yourself. So having a leadership position is having an influential position. Now, if you look at verse 22 in the same chapter, 1 John 2, 22. 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar? Who is a liar? But he that denies that Jesus is the Christ. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. My last name is Sue, taking after my husband's last name. The last name of Jesus is not Christ. Christ means the anointed one. Christ means the anointing. So he that denies that Jesus is the anointed Messiah, he that denies the anointing, he is the Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Now, it's very important that we pay attention to the anointing because we as Christians, we carry the word Christ. So Christians means those who are anointed of God. So say with me to yourself, I am anointed of God. So it's very important that you don't belittle yourself. It's very, very important that you don't feel bad or inferior about yourself because the greater one lives on the inside of you. And I know, you know, from my experience of being a pastor, is that a lot of people, I'm talking about Christians, who don't really have any confidence in themselves in being a Christian and who usually don't really... Um, feel bad, or don't, sorry, who don't really feel good about themselves. A lot of times they feel bad about themselves. They feel inferior about themselves. So it's very, very important that we understand that we are called Christians. So the anointed one with his anointing dwells in us. Amen? So it's very, very important that we are conscious of who we are, the reality of being born again, the reality of carrying that anointing in and on ourselves. So here we have the definition of the Antichrist. So the definition of the Antichrist is that it's the spirit that denies Jesus is the anointed Messiah, that denies Jesus is the Son of God, that denies the human yet sinless body of Jesus. There are some teachings that deny the human body, the sinless human body of Jesus. And then we'll continue to read, and that will be clearer to you. Now go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. Now why was the apostle John writing all these? Because that very spirit was seeking to penetrate into the early church. So understand that. So the Apostle Paul was writing all these in order to warn the followers of Jesus Christ against that spirit of Antichrist. So if you look at chapter 4, verse 3, every spirit, so we're talking about a lot of evil spirits. We're talking about different kinds of evil spirits. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, or in the human body, is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come. And even now, in the early days of the church, even now, already is in the world. So we need to understand that the presence of the Antichrist had been for a while. It is a spirit trying to influence whoever will yield to it or believe in it. So it's been for a long time. 
Now let's look at another scripture. The last scripture is 2 John chapter 1, verse 7. 2 John chapter 1, verse 7. For many deceivers, so it has been made very clear that it is a deceiving spirit. For many deceivers are entered into the world, from the realm of the spirit into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an anti-Christ. You know, there are some that believe that Jesus is only a historical person, only a teacher, but they deny the anointing. They deny the, the Godhead that Jesus belongs to. They deny the anointing that's upon Jesus. So that's also a spirit of antichrist. So the definition of the antichrist is that the spirit that says that Jesus Christ had not come in the flesh, in the human body, is a deceiving spirit that denies the incarnation, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. Because now there's a lot of teaching on the end times and there is a lot of teaching on the Antichrist. So that's why I really feel that the Lord is asking me to give you this truth from the Word and also from church history. Because anything that you don't know, anything that you are not sure of from the Word of God, you would tend to believe. So it's very, very important that we don't serve God with ignorance and we don't serve God with passivity. So if you look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5, Wherefore, when he comes into the world, this is referring to Jesus. So when Jesus comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you would not but a body have you prepared me. So this is talking about Jesus thanking God the Father for the body that he had prepared for him. So in this scripture, we notice that the body is even more important than what? Sacrifice and offering. The body plays a more important role than sacrifices and offerings. So why is the body of Jesus so important? Why do we have to pay attention to the body of Jesus? Why do we have to pay attention to our body? Why is our physical health so important? Why is our physical functions so important? Why is our physical operations, daily living so important? Only with a body can Jesus contact his people. Only with a body could he demonstrate to his people at his time how to live out this anointed life. He had to demonstrate to his disciples and his followers with his body how to live out this anointed life. All the ministries and all the works of Jesus would not have been carried out without his body. If Jesus did not have a body which carried our sickness, our pain, our sin on the cross, then there would be no salvation. How come as a community we usually honor our doctors? Because our doctors take care of our bodies. Everyone is very conscious of your body. Everyone is very health conscious because you know that you can function well and you can't live well without your body. So it's very, very important that we understand it. Without the body, there would be no incarnation, no death, no resurrection, and no ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if God places such a high value on the human body, how much more, you and I? It's very, very important that you look at your body through the eyes of God. That you take care of your body and you believe God for health and healing for your body. And you can pray for each other. The Bible says, pray for one another that you be healed. Amen. 
So what is the spirit of Antichrist? It's that spirit that spiritualizes everything. That belittles, undermines, and neglects the physical body with its health, with its acts, that reduces people to mere religious puppets and victims of sickness, disease, and poverty. Your body matters to God. Your body is very, very important to Him. It is His will for your body to do well. It is His will for your body to be healthy, to be strong, to be vigorous. It is not the will of God for your body to deteriorate with age. It is not the will of God for you to stop, to stop the functions of your body or the functions of your organs or the functions of, of all the blood vessels, the heart and all the tracts, you know, in te- uh, what, what we call them, intestinal, intestinal tracts in your body, just because you're aging. So we need to stop believing the spirit that denies the body, the spirit that belittles the body, the spirit that tells you that your body is not important. Now, there are two sides to it. The one, one side is that if my body is not important, that's what they taught their cows, then I can do whatever I want with my body. I can go into fornication. I can, I can you know, watch porn. I can smoke. I can drink because my body is not spiritual anyway. God doesn't care about my body anyway. That is, once again, the spirit of Antichrist that tells you to neglect and disregard your body. Our bodies are God-given and are highly valued. God wants your body to be healthy and to be strong. Why? Because He needs your body to carry out His will, to manifest His goodness, to do His work among the people that you live with. Our salvation is threefold. And that's what I taught when I was in China. Our salvation is threefold. Spirit, soul, and body. These three parts are interconnected. They affect one another. A strong spirit will cause your mind to be clever and wise. A strong spirit will cause your mind to be clear instead of confused. And your mind, in a way, does affect your will and your emotions. With your will, you choose to follow the ways of God. And with your emotions, sanctified by the Spirit, sanctified by the Word of God, you have holy emotions. Holy emotions that love God and love people. Instead of being tormented by negative emotions, negative thoughts, instead of being tormented by depression and oppression and rejection and dejection, you accept yourself just as you are with the love of God. And you accept the people around you just as they are with the love of God. And your body then function healthily and strongly because you do not allow any negative emotions, negative thoughts, negative self-will to damage your physical body. Can we say amen? How many people that you know and I know suffer physical problems due to a malfunction of emotions, thoughts, and will? also due to poverty. How many people that you know and I know have a weak spirit? And that's why their will is weak, their emotions are confused and messed up, and their thoughts confused. And as a result of that, their relationships are not working. And they're all the time in strife. They're all the time quarreling and fighting with the people around them on the outside and also on the inside. Jesus had come with a human body to redeem our body. Jesus had come with a soul to redeem our soul, redeem our will and mind and emotions. Jesus had come with a spirit so we can have his emotional, we can have his eternal spirit, sorry, 
so we can have His eternal Spirit. Lift up your hands with me and say, I have an eternal Spirit, a powerful soul, and a healthy body. Amen, amen, hallelujah. And the Bible says that we are members of the body of Jesus Christ. And because we are members of His body, and that's why we are entitled to His health and healing. Can you look at your own body? Can I ask you just for one moment, look at your own body, okay? Can I ask you to just think about the organs that you have on the inside? Your lungs, your kidneys, your liver, right? And also your respiratory tracts, and also your intestines, your intestines, and also your heart, your brain with all the gray matter, white matter, your memory, everything that is within this body, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, your limbs, your fingers, your legs, your feet, everything within our body must function together in unity. Can you imagine if our body starts to fight against itself, the organs start to fight against itself, the legs saying to the mind, no, I'm not walking. The mind sends the signal, we're walking. And the legs said, no, I'm not walking. Can you imagine that? There is a sickness called the octoimmune sickness. What is octoimmune sickness? It's the body fighting against itself. It's a terrible sickness. It's so important for us to know that God had created us to walk in unity. To walk in unity. Even if you don't agree, if you disagree, but still walk in unity, in peace, and pray for one another. It is so important for us to be nice to one another, to think good about each other, to stop being judgmental against one another, to stop being prejudiced against one another. Because when God, God's Word says that when His people walk together in unity, there he, you don't even have to ask for it. There he commands his blessings. You will never find somebody who will see the same as you do. You will never find somebody who thinks exactly the same as you do. You will never. The key is that we accept one another. We embrace one another. Amen. There is unity in diversity. We are different, the same way that we look different. We function in a different way. We think in a different way. But still, we belong to the big circle of unity, which is in Christ. Can we say amen? Because we are members of his body. Amen. How many times you have experienced when you feel bitter against somebody? When you, when you harbor grudges against someone, when you have a bad thought about somebody, when you have a bad memory about somebody, you feel bad yourself. You lose the joy. And you can't pray because you've lost the peace. Because it's not the will of God for us to function like that. When we talk about divine health, we are talking about living and in the way that God has ordained for us to live. It's to live in peace with one another. Can we say amen? Come on, say with me. I choose to live in peace with one another. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We believe and we receive healing because we believe in the incarnation and the resurrection of the body of Jesus. The body of Jesus is very, very important. We follow the body of Jesus. What do I mean by that? When we read the four Gospels, we see how his body functions. We see how he conducts his body. We see how he conducts his mind, his will, and his emotions. We see where he goes. We see what he does. Amen. All of that is his body. Amen. And we can have divine health and we can have divine healing because Jesus went about doing good and healing all, A-L-L, -L, all that were oppressed of the devil. He did not just heal the Christians. Well, you ask me, Pastor Dory, he's not a Christian. Can I pray for him? Absolutely. She's not a Christian. Can I pray for her? Absolutely. 
For God so loved the world. Healing is the manifestation of the love of God. Provision is the manifestation of the love of God. Guidance is the manifestation of the love of God. God has never asked us to harbor any bitterness, any hatred, any prejudice against non-Christians. And we need to correct ourselves if we have that kind of attitude. Even if people don't agree with you, they may not think the same as you. But your duty, my duty, is still to walk in love towards them. Can we say amen? I'll show you how important it is. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Who will not take care of his house? Let me ask you, do you take care of your house? If you do, lift up your hands. So will the Holy Spirit take care of his house? So will the Holy Spirit take care of your body? Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. The healing ministry of Jesus was his prominent ministry. And also he commanded he commanded his disciples, he commanded his church to continue to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead, to cast out devils. All of that was to do with the human body. So you ask me, Pastor Dora, I'm not sure if I'm anointed to pray for the sick. Are you a Christian? If you are a Christian, then you are anointed. But you say, but what if I pray for them and they don't get healed? How do you know if they don't get healed? I pray for people and I didn't know. Only when, I mean, not everybody told me, but only when they told me then I realized that, yeah, they, they got healed. Or yeah, they got pregnant. Or yeah, they got their uh, job. Or yeah, they got their money. You know what I mean? Amen. We don't do what the Lord tells us to do based on what people tell us. You don't do what God tells you to do based on how you feel, based on situations and circumstances. We do what God tells us to do based on what Jesus had done. That's why he had come in a body, so we could see how his body functions. Can we say amen? We see God through the body of Jesus, how he functioned in his body. Jesus is the express image of God in the book of Hebrews. Jesus came in a human body to make, listen to this, to make God available, accessible, visible, touchable, and most important of all, identifiable. So you and I can identify ourselves with Jesus. Jesus showed us the will of the Father by his actions. The will of God, listen to this, is very important. The will of God is not mysterious. For God is not mysterious. Christianity is not a mysterious religion. Remember, Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. That's why the body of Jesus is for us to see. When you read your Gospels, you see how Jesus lived, how he functioned, how he did his ministry, and you do exactly the same. Because you're living like what he lived in the past. Amen. It is very, very important for us to study church history. And I know that not many Christians study church history. So I'm here to give you a little bit of church history. It is so important for us to live out the word so that our faith is based on the knowledge of the truth, not based on feelings, circumstances, nor what people say or tell us. I know that, you know, a lot of us, we watch a lot of YouTube. And we watch a lot of so-called Christian YouTubes. And I have found myself confused because there's so many teachers. And I don't know them personally. I don't know their lives. 
And uh, there's so many teachings coming from so many schools. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, you have to stop. Focus is very, very important. There are those that I do know and I do follow. Focus is very, very important. And the Lord reminded me, remember those days when you didn't have any YouTube? When you didn't have any internet? How did you do? I said, I did very well. I studied my Bible. I did my research. I researched from the Bible. I researched from encyclopedia. I researched from church history books. So it's very, very important that you don't lose your focus. Watching YouTube cannot replace your own personal study of the Bible. Only one amen? Watching YouTube can never replace your personal study of the Word of God. Watching YouTube can never replace your own fellowship with the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. It is so important that we know and we understand that. Ignorance and passivity. Ignorance and passivity are the breeding ground for devils. The Word of God says in the book of Hosea, my people are destroyed, implying that there is a destroyer. For the lack of, you tell me, for the lack of knowledge. So knowledge is very, very important. The opposite of knowledge is ignorance. Ignorance and passivity are the breeding ground for devils. A lack of focus is called distractions. How many of us have realized that our attention span has shortened? If you go on the internet, you know, go on YouTube, now they have called the shorts. And I was told that their attention span of the average teenager today is less than two minutes. Less than two minutes. If you want them to watch your teaching, make it under one minute. <laughs> How many of us know that when your mind is healthy, you can pay attention for a long time? How many of you know that your attention span is one of the indications of your mental health? The longer you can pay attention to something, the stronger your mind is. And that's why the devil wants to destroy our power to focus, our attention span. It is important for us to identify our priorities our goals in life. Otherwise, you'll be pulled in different directions. Everything has its importance. It's very important that we prioritize our time. Everyone has 24 hours. How many of you would say that Jesus would be the most, the most what's the word, the busiest person? Because his life was so important, right? Nobody as important as Jesus. And yet he lived only 30 odd years. 33 years, right? So he must have planned and prioritized his time. If you don't plan and don't prioritize your time, you'll be pulled to different directions. And you'll be doing different things, going here and going there, and busy and busy and busy, and at the end of your life, achieving nothing. Is that okay? Is that okay for me to tell you that? If you look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Matthew 6, 33, but seek you first, seek you first, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 33, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When you have the first, you will have the second, you will have the third. And you won't be like a dog chasing after his own tail. When you start your day right in the morning with God, in prayers, your day will be arranged good. You won't bump into accidents. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. But it's not automatic. You have to desire it. You have to pray it out. You have to confess it. You have to believe it. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be 
shall be, shall be added unto you. God must be first. Because He's the all-knowing. He's the source. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Can we say amen? Lift up your hands with me and say, I'll be wise. Amen. In the times of the early church, there were two teachings that tried to infiltrate into the believers. Gnosticism and Manichism. Gnosticism and Manichism. Their teachings are that God had predestined every man for salvation or damnation. Man does not have a choice. Now, how many times have you heard yourself or have you heard people say, whatever God wants? Come on. How many times have you heard yourself say that? How many times you've heard other people say that? Whatever God wants? Or if it's God's will? Or if God is willing? How many times you've heard that? They sound so humble and good, yet it's the spirit of Gnosticism. It's the spirit of the Antichrist, which teaches a fatalistic mentality, which teaches, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. It's God's choice. I don't have a say in it. God's will is too high too holy, too mysterious for me to know. It's a way to say that I don't know, so I'm not responsible. And some even go to the extent to say that God has sent my grandchild an accident so that he can take him to heaven with him. And the grandchild was only seven years old. It is the spirit of Antichrist that tells you that God is mysterious. His will is far beyond you. You don't know His will. And you don't have a, ch don't have a choice, and you don't have a say in His matters. An antichrist spirit is that spirit that denies the free will of man, that teaches that God controls one's life. The will of God is too mysterious, too high up, too holy to be known by mere mortals. And you'll notice that people that believe in that kind of teaching always tend to be very, um, they see themselves as just, you know, mere mortals in the hands of God. Uh, they don't see any significance in themselves. And uh, they tend to be very bossy, tend to be very religious, and tend to spiritualize everything. That's a religious antichrist spirit. And this kind of teaching teaches that how dare you to think that you can discern and know the will of God, to have His guidance and provision. So you just live out your life, maybe you know a little bit and don't know a lot. And when you plan, you don't pray through, you just, you know, see how I go and see how God leads me and see how it will show, you know, how it will turn up with a lot of unclarity, with a lot of confusion. You're never sure about anything. You're never sure of the will of God. You're never sure of God's plan for your life. I'm not sure if God wants to heal me. If he wants to heal me, he will. But if not, it's okay. After all, this life doesn't matter. It's the afterlife that's more important. No, this life matters. What you can do in this life, you cannot do when you go to heaven. You don't need to save souls in heaven. You can save souls here. You can build up Christians, build up the knowledge and the understanding of the word of God here. You can love people here. You can affect a lot of people here. The great commission that Jesus gave to the church was for here, not for heaven. Can we say amen? 
Amen. So the nature of God, according to that kind of teaching, is distorted to become like that of a dictator, a control freak. And a lot of times people portray God as schizophrenic. Why would God not heal you when Jesus commissioned the church to lay hand on the sick, to heal the sick? Why would God not heal you? It's so important that we in this clarity. The early church believed that man's free choice had a major contribution or ultimate determination to his cause of life and to his ultimate destiny. God had granted the faculty of free will to all mankind and had also preserved that free will. The Gnostics who claimed themselves to be the real Christians taught that man's nature was so corrupted and ruined in the Garden of Eden that man did not now have a free choice between good and evil anymore. The Gnostics viewed the flesh as sinful, as a sinful substance, and they denied that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And that's why I read you the scriptures just now that they were called by the early fathers the Antichrist. Gnosticism believes that sin is the substance of the human body, which is inherited at conception, so that man is born sinful or with a sinful nature. The early church, on the other hand, taught that sin was a result of the free choice of the human will, which is originated by the individual. The Gnostics taught that man was sinful by nature, but the early church and all the epistles taught that man was sinful by choice. Let me ask you a very important question. How did Adam and Eve fall? Was it by nature or was it by choice? By choice. How did Cain fall? Was it by nature or by choice? By choice, because God talked to Cain. God told him, you could resist this. If the Bible tells us that you have not because you ask not, is it the will of God for you to have not? No. To have, you have to choose to ask. To have, you have to choose to ask because you have not because you ask not. So who decides whether you're going to have or not? You. It's not by nature. It's by choice. Clement, a follower of Paul, he said that free will was given because he who is good by his own choice is really good. But he who is made good by another under the necessity is not really good. If you choose to do good because of your wife, you are not really good. If you choose to do good because of your children, you are not really good. What is true goodness? True goodness is when you know and you choose to do it. True goodness comes from your choice to be good and to do good. Not because it's a religious duty, not because it's an obligation, not because it's for somebody else's sake. Men this is Irenaeus, another very important uh, early church father. He refuted the Gnostics by saying, Men are possessed with the free will and endowed with the faculty of making a choice. How many of you know that trees can't choose? Vegetables can't choose. But people can choose. He also said that 
without compulsion, without compulsion, he has the power by his own will and choice to perform God's commandments. Man is possessed of a free will from the beginning. As God has a free will, people who were created in the image of God also has been given a free will. It is your free will to come to church this morning. It is your choice to come to church this morning. Your choices make up your life. Your life is the accumulation of all your choices. You are who you are by choice. You're never a victim. Can we say amen? The most important part of our faith is our choice. We are who we are by com we are who we are by choice, not by compulsion, not by pressure. We choose to be born again. We choose to worship God. We choose to come to the fellowship of the believers, the church. We choose to serve God. If there are any obstacles that you cannot come to church, you pray for God to provide a way for you to come to church. You don't yield your free choice to circumstances and situations. You don't say, I cannot come to church because I don't have a transport. Your choice is greater than your circumstances and your situations. You don't say, I can't walk in love because my friend doesn't treat me nicely. Your choice to walk by love is greater than how people treat you. And if we train ourselves to live like this, then truly we will not be victims. Truly we will be victors. I know we sing a lot of songs about being victors and not victims, but not many Christians, sad to say, train themselves to walk like this. It takes training. Come on, say with me, it takes training. One more time, it takes training. You can only lay hold of your negative emotions and reject them by training. The devil will still try to come in, but when you constantly reject them, you constantly reject them. You constantly choose not to allow negative emotions to control your life. You constantly choose not to allow negative thoughts, negative presumptions to control your mind. You constantly choose not to allow self-will to control your will. Then you become powerful. Powerful in your soul. Powerful in your body. Can we say amen? Then you're truly more than a conqueror. Amen. Go, say to the person next to you, it's time to start training yourself. Amen. Let me ask you, didn't Jesus choose to go to the cross? Yes or no? Yes. Didn't Jesus said to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. Didn't he function by choice? He could have asked a legion of angels and set him free from the cross. But he chose to stay on that cross. Why? Because the significance of your decisions will empower you in the realm of the Spirit. You know, devils can't really attack you until you choose to believe them, until you choose to be afraid of them, until you choose not to call on the Lord. It is important for you to call on the Lord. Devils will keep attacking you if you don't call on God. If you accept your weakness and you recycle your sin, it's not because it's your nature. It's not because it's your fallen nature. It's because you have not called on the Lord. It's because you have not used your free choice, your free will for the blessings and the deliverance and the healing and the glory of God to come into your life. Can we say amen? When I went to the church in China, they could not gather openly. They couldn't. And they could not have a big meeting like this. And they could not even sing and worship loudly. 
So I changed my schedule to just topical Bible studies, you know, and they all enjoyed it so much. They benefited from it a lot. I mean, lives were changed, transformed, bodies were healed, businesses were, were you know, were made good. And uh, we only had one service in which we could sing a bit loudly, not too loud, but a bit loudly. And we could only do three songs, only with a guitar. And yet they were so fervent, you know, they wanted to know God. You know, they came to the church, they came to the service at the risk of being caught. I mean, we had to gather in secret, not in public. We have to make sure that no police would ever come. And also, they have to make sure that nobody offends anyone, because if you offend somebody, somebody may go to the police and report you. So it's very, very, it's, it's amazing, you know, the passion to grow in the Lord. And I know that some of them, they even have their spouses, you know, the, you know there's one lady, I'm going to show you her photo. I mean, her spouse is a policeman. <laughs> And then uh, some, you know, their family, brothers, you know, um, are policemen. So they have to, you know, keep their faith secret. And they have to come to church in a, in a secret way. And yet they are leaders in the church. They are leaders in the church. They are passionate and they're winning souls. I think it, it reminds me, you know, I shouldn't be taking this for granted. It reminds me that, you know, I've, Sort of like used to like a comfortable Christian life and, you know, taking things for granted. It reminds me that it's important for us to take our faith seriously. I mean, if you talk about the early church, I mean, they were even worse. They couldn't gather in public. The early church, the book of Acts, they couldn't gather in public because the Romans would, have, would arrest them. They dare not offend anyone because, you know, they could go to the Romans and uh, report them, and they would be arrested. Amen? So don't take what you have for granted. Don't major in the minor. Can we say amen? It doesn't matter. Don't be petty. It doesn't matter. As long as we have the major, as long as we have Jesus, as long as we have the word, as long as we have our relationships in Christ Jesus, God would take care of the rest. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. Amen. It is our choice. It is our choices that make us strong or weak Christians. The commitment to prayer. I love the word commitment. The commitment to prayer, the commitment to live by the love of God is a choice. It's time for Christians to take up the responsibility of self-discipline, of living by choice, instead of saying, it's God's will. Have you ever made wrong choices for which you had regretted? Come on. The good news is that Jesus had come to redeem us from our wrong choices and wrong decisions. Remember I talked about the blessings of time. Things that were not good, they were in your yesterdays. And the Word of God says that the minute you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But whose choice it is to confess? Come on, tell me whose choice it is. We, our choice. Whose choice it is to let the past be past? Whose choice is that? Our choice. Whose choice it is to live a new beginning? Our choice. Amen? Amen? So let me ask you a very important question. Are your choices important? Yes. Make well-informed biblical choices. Make your choices based on the word and based on prayer. There are no prayers without a careful study of the word of God. A lot of us, we don't pray is because we don't read the word. The word will bring prayers to you. The word will bring prayers into your spirit and come out of your mouth. 
You pray with the word. Don't pray without the word. Always pray. The word of God becomes your prayers. Can we say amen? I want to mention three very important people in church history. They are Luther, Augustine, and Calvin. Now, they are very important in the negative sense. <laughs> they were important not in the good sense, but in the negative sense. Yes, I'm talking about Martin Luther. I'm talking about St. Augustine, the Catholics call him. And I'm also talking about John Calvin. Well, they taught the bondage. They taught the moral impotence of the human will. They said man, by making a bad use of free will, lost both himself and his will. Free will, having been made captive, can do nothing now in the way of righteousness. Man, at his creation, received a great degree of free will, but lost it all in the Garden of Eden by sinning. That's what they taught. The early church, the apostles, the disciples all wrote about the freedom of the will. Whereas Martin Luther wrote an entire book called The Bondage of the Will. Luther, in his later years, when embittered by his failure to convert the Jews to Christianity, because in the beginning, Martin Luther was doing his best to convert the Jews into Christianity, but the Jews kept rejecting him. And so he became very bitter. So it's very, very important for us. Yes, you know, we reach out to people. We try to win them to Jesus. But don't get sad or bitter when they refuse to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior at the time that you know. Just keep praying. Keep believing. Keep loving them. Keep embracing them. Don't put a condition Praying for them, because true conversion comes from the person's free choice. True conversion comes from the person's free will. If he does it because you are his wife, if he does it because you are, his hus you are her husband, or because you are the parents, then there's no true salvation. Can we say amen? Amen. So Martin Luther, he got very angry and bitter against the Jews. Because they would not accept his conversion. So look at what bitterness can do to this man. Look at what bitterness had done to him. He became outspokenly anti-Semitic. He became publicly anti-Semitic against the Jews. He proposed in his book, What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? He said, first, Set fire in their synagogues or schools. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and Christendom. So that God might see that we are Christians. <laughs> Very important, you don't allow your political view to bring any bitterness, anger towards a candidate whom you don't endorse. Are you listening to me? You don't let what the, the government of that nation affects you to become bitter and angry against them as a government or against that country. You keep yourself in the love of God. Come on, lift up your hands with me. Keep myself to, in the love of God. One more time, keep myself in the love of God. And second, Martin Luther said, I advise that the houses be raised and destroyed. Can I ask you, what's the nationality of Martin Luther? Somebody? German. German. Augustine also taught many false doctrines. Augustine, you know, he's the bishop in the Catholic Church. Highly regarded by a lot of Christians. He taught many false doctrines, such as the sinless life of Mary, such as praying to the dead, such as praying to Mary, so Mary would intercede for you to Jesus, such as persecuting 
heretics, burn them, such as infant damnation, because they're not Catholics, they're damned from birth, infant baptism, believing that baptism can bless a person, they believe in baptismal regeneration. His false teaching had done a lot of damage to the church. And yet, the most important or the most um, detrimental false teaching that he had was regarding to the human nature and the free will. Now, I have been to the Philippines. I was so shocked when I went to their chapels, <laughs> churches. They had, ba they had baby Jesus there. I think it was like Jesus, three-year-old or four-year-old, you know, <laughs> as a child with a crown <laughs> and with a scepter <laughs> and with a lot of candles in front of him. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculously religious. And yet, the people would just bow before those idols. And when it said so clearly in the ten one of the Ten Commandments that you should have no idols before me, and that's why the, the teachers of the church, the leaders of the church, they are so important. Teaching the word is so, so important. If you don't have the word, you'll be ignorant. And the devil will make use of your ignorance and reduce you to a nobody. So, his false teaching regarding the human nature and the free will that the human nature was damnable and the free will could not be used anymore. And that spread beyond the Catholic Church into the Protestant churches. Hitler, from the same country, Germany, Hitler advocated positive Christianity. Positive Christianity, a uniquely Nazi form of Christianity that rejected Christianity's Jewish root and the Old Testament and portrayed true Christianity as a fight against the Jews. Wasn't that what Martin Luther advocated? When a person doesn't believe in the free will, he will be judgmental and controlling, as can be seen in the tragedies of both, of both Luther and Hitler. I want to remind you that Germany had more than 50% Christians at the time of Hitler. More than 50% Christians. And then some of them call themselves, you know, uh, another, another church, or Catholics, sorry. Some of them, they, they call themselves Catholics. And some of them, they say that they believe in a God. But only a very small percentage uh, was atheists. So don't let your religion fool you. Practical Christianity is the truth. Practicing Christians are true Christians. Hitler refers to Martin Luther as one of the great reformers of history and as such one of the great warriors of this world. The Nazis themselves acknowledged Martin Luther as their spiritual leader. Nationalism is good. I'm not saying that nationalism is bad. But when it becomes forceful, discriminatory and controlling that it becomes demonic. We must never force our way. We must honor and respect people's choices. As we pray in the truth and in the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, God will witness to the hearts of the people that we pray for and they will make the right decisions that will bless them and bless God. We must refuse to be bigots or prejudiced or small circle. It's not just my family, my ethnic group, and no more. When I came to Australia, I chose to mix with the Aussies. 
I did not go to a Chinese church. I did not just fellowship with Chinese. I did not promote my own ethnic group. Because Sonny and I had made the decision to come into this country. We call this country our country. We pray for the leaders of this country. We voted for the leaders that God put in our hearts to vote for. I believe that this is very, very important. I have seen with my own eyes different migrants that have come into Australia. They have their own groups, you know, they have their own groups. And some of them didn't even bother to learn English because there's no need to because they, they have their own groups. If you go to Sunnybank, you can do very well without speaking English. I'm sure, uh, where's that place that's full of Vietnamese? Inala, you can go to Inala without speaking English. It's not right. It's not right. It's not right to just make good use of this country without being a contributing member to this country. If you agree, say amen. 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 Hallelujah. God is no respecter of ethnic groups. The Bible says that there will be different tribes and different tongues in the book of Revelations. God is no respecter of persons, he's no respecter of nations, he's no respecter of ethnic groups. But when you try to force your way through, when you try to only take care of your own and neglect others, then you have entertained the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist means anti-anointing. Not so much as the anointing that works in somebody else's life, as the anointing that works in your life. If I don't believe in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, if I don't believe in his resurrection, then I won't be able to flow in divine health and healing. If I don't believe that the body of Jesus, he put the, you know, the body of Jesus, he could lay hand on the sick and they recovered. If I don't believe that the mouth of Jesus, he could speak the word of God and then multiply the fish and the bread, then I am negating my own prayers. Because every part of my body, Jesus had redeemed and empowered to follow his commandments. And his commandment is that we pray, is that we do signs and wonders and miracles. Can we say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Finally, church history tells us that the teachings that we have inherited from our Christian heritage, I was so happy when I got saved that to know that Christianity has a kingdom and has a, a big group of people and has heritage. I was so excited to hear and to read about the early church fathers. I was so excited to read church history, histories of revival. You know, I was so excited there would be somebody out there who would write songs that we could sing in church. We can never do it all ourselves. Isn't that true? So we must think outside of our small circle. We must embrace other Christians. The church is a place where we can serve one another. We can receive help. We can also get help. Can we say amen? Give help and receive help. Can we say amen? That's Christianity. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. So I want to highlight finally two main schools. I know that all churches have been influenced by them. All Christians have been influenced them by them. They are Calvinism and Armenianism. Calvinism and Armenianism. So Calvinism, of course, originated from John Calvin. And Armenianism, Armenianism originated from Arminius and also John Wesley. Okay? So Calvinism believes that men are deprived. De what's the word? Depraved. Men are depraved actually corrupt. They are now incapable of making good choices. So have to be predestined either to salvation or damnation by God. Because you can't choose. Continuing the doctrine of 
Augustine. Augustine. Arminianism believes that man's free will is intact, so can choose the salvation of Jesus Christ for themselves, continuing with the teachings of the early church fathers. Well, you said, didn't Jesus pray, not my will, but your will be done? Hmm, I'm glad you asked the question. Are we assuming that Jesus is ignorant of the will of the Father? Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus ignorant of the will of the Father? Absolutely not. Jesus was fully aware of the will of the Father, which was that he would go to the cross, which was that he would do signs and wonders and miracles, which was that he would love all people. Jesus was fully aware of the will of the Father. Amen. So it's so important for us to interpret our Bible correctly. Jesus is not saying, oh, whatever, whatever you say, God, whatever you say, Father, like some of us pray. No, no. The matter of fact is, as a Christian, you need to know the will of your Father. When I was in China, there was a cult that tried to infiltrate into the church. That says that we are now in the end times. It's not the time for anybody to have babies. You just have spiritual babies. You need to discern. Is that of God? Absolutely no. And I was shocked. A lot of people follow that. and They lost everything. And one of the sisters who came to me, she said that she had backslidden. And uh, she became very sick, and she became very sad. She lost all her, her faith in God. She lost her uh, walk with God, and she came to the teaching. And she was moved. She was saved. She came back to God. Amen? It's so important that we belong to a body. The body of Christ is very big, but make sure that you belong to a home church. Can we say amen? We must start living and doing what we know to be the will of God. How do we know the will of God? In the Word of God. In the Word of God. Not in our feelings. You can't say, well, God understands why I can't forgive Him. <laughs> no, God doesn't understand. God says, when you stand praying, forgive. <laughs> God says, if you don't forgive, neither will I forgive you. Because it will be a blockage. Amen. So we walk in and we live by what we know. And then more and more and more will be given to us to know. And then more and more power will be released for us to do what we know. Can we say amen? Amen. So let us be determined to be active Christians. To take our stand. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. To arrange our priorities. Amen. Finally, your will has to be used. How many of you know that if you don't use it, you lose it? That's why people exercise. You don't use it, you lose it. That's why we have to use our memory. And reading the Bible is very good for you. Praying is very good for you. Why? Because you keep remembering the scriptures. You use them in prayer. Okay? So the same, you need to use your willpower. If you don't use it, you will lose it. God has given to every one of us our willpower to make good choices, good decisions. Amen. With information, with Bible knowledge, use it, use it, use it. And you will be mentally healthy and strong, volitionally powerful for Jesus. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. Give the Lord a big hand of praise. Amen. God is good. Amen. Every eye closed, every head bowed.